Mr. Chairman, today we have about 388 parts per million in the atmosphere. I think in the age of the dinosaurs where we had most flora and fauna, we were probably at 4,000 parts per million. There is a theological debate that this is a carbon-starved planet. In a high CO2 world, we'd only be recreating conditions that existed millions of years ago. Why couldn't we go back to that? What could possibly go wrong? Among climate deniers, at least among those who believe the world is more than 5,000 years old, the claim is often made that returning to CO2 levels of past geological ages would be harmless or even beneficial for life. Skeptical websites like this one make the claim that in this or that period, CO2 and climate did not track as expected. To the consternation of global warming proponents, the late Ordovician period was also an ice age with CO2 concentrations nearly 12 times that of today, 4,400 parts per million. The author of this website is not a climate scientist. He is, or was, an engineer for the West Virginia Office of Miner Safety. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Since I'm not a mining safety engineer, I'm forced to rely on scientists who actually know something about climate and have earned the respect and trust of their peers. One such person is Richard Alley of Penn State University, one of the world's foremost experts on paleoclimate, who addressed the American Geophysical Union on the history of CO2 and climate. Now, when I started doing this, when I was learning this as a student and as a young professor, there were a bunch of places that we'd point at and say, oh, but there, there was a big global change and CO2 didn't go with it. And in the time I've been in this field watching, almost all of those have disappeared. So the Ordovician, we thought, well, there was glaciation was CO2 was high, and then you sort of refine the sampling, and look, there's a drop in CO2 at the glaciation. Tracking concentrations of CO2 through Earth's history, scientists have identified systems that pump CO2 into and out of the atmosphere. The oceans absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and plankton use this carbon for both photosynthesis and to make their shells. When the plankton die, they fall to the sea floor. And here, over thousands of years, their shells are slowly transformed into rock. In this way, huge amounts of carbon dioxide, the very gas that keeps our planet warm, are removed from the atmosphere. Where plates in the Earth's crust collide, the rock on the seafloor containing carbon from the plankton shells is carried deep into the Earth. This is called subduction. As it descends, this layer of rock is heated and melts, releasing carbon dioxide. This gas is returned back into the atmosphere during an eruption. It's a thermostat. Turn up the temperature, CO2 is drawn down and that cools. Turn down the temperature, CO2 builds up and that warms. But when CO2 is released too fast for the Earth to absorb, it builds up in the atmosphere, sometimes to catastrophic effect. 251 million years ago, basically almost every critter on the planet dies. 250 million years ago, hundreds of thousands of square miles of Siberia caught fire. The remaining evidence of this great eruption is a vast area of lava flows comparable in size to modern Europe, known today as the Siberian Traps. 
In turn, the traps cause global warming, changing the chemistry of the seas so that deadly hydrogen sulfide producing bacteria begin to thrive. And it turns out that there are bugs in the ocean, green sulfur bacteria, that use hydrogen sulfide rather than water in their photosynthesis, which means that the ocean surface is full of hydrogen sulfide. And if you breathe very much hydrogen sulfide, you die. Sometime here, the ocean gets, gets full of hydrogen, it runs out of oxygen, and then it gets yuxinic, and it, it fills up with hydrogen sulfide, and then it kills off most stuff on the planet. And it turns out that that happens to be a warm time. There's a big warming coming up to that. And the warming seems to have been because there was a big volcanism. And this is far more than a CO2 story. It's far more than a warmth story. But when the ocean's cold, it's really hard to run it out of oxygen. And when the ocean's warm, it's a lot easier. This is fairly f simple physics. And so once again, there's a warmth here. There's a warmth that's attributed to CO2. We can't figure out how else to get it. And that, combined with some other things, gives you a very interesting event. It starts with volcanoes spewing carbon dioxide. Next step, global warming. The oceans heat up and lose their oxygen. Nasty bacteria take over, burping out lots of poisonous gas. And the result? Mass extinction. In disturbing new studies, scientists at the University of York have shown a connection between greenhouse warming and mass extinction events over the last 500 million years. Moreover, the temperatures predicted from a business-as-usual approach to greenhouse gases are within the range of the warmest greenhouse phases associated with those extinctions. In the distant past, greenhouse phases have often followed massive volcanic events. But today, according to the U.S. Geological Survey, human activities release more than a hundred times as much CO2 per year as all the volcanoes on the planet. Until recently, the best records of temperature and CO2 were from ice cores going back only a few hundred thousand years. Now advanced research vessels drilling for sediments in the South Pacific have unearthed a new record using the shells of tiny fossilized sea creatures a record going back a full 20 million years. Aradna Tripathi and her team from UCLA, the California Institute of Technology, and Cambridge have published results that confirm, extend, and reinforce the connection between CO2 and climate. According to the researchers, the last time carbon dioxide levels were apparently as high as they are today, and were sustained at those levels, global temperatures were 5 to 10 degrees Fahrenheit higher than they are today, and sea level was approximately 75 to 120 feet higher. Last week or the week before, we get this great paper by Tripathi et al. Here's temperature, and here's CO2, and they again are tracking each other. There's still some uncertainties floating around in there. But two years ago, I would have said, wow, we've got a big global temperature change, and it's not CO2. And more data, it sort of tracks the CO2 again. And so the anomalies are disappearing fairly rapidly. Um, and there aren't a lot. I can't sort of think right now what I would point at and say, wow, there the temperature did something big without CO2. The story of the Earth is immense and diverse, and it's easy to get confused and mangle history, to mix things together that never belong together in the real world. What was natural in the distant past might not be a good fit alongside man's creations. Human beings and the climate of the ancient world could find themselves on a collision course. If we unleash changes on the planet which we barely understand, could we find ourselves swallowed in the chaos that results? <laughs>